So my name's Ian Craggs. I work for IBM on the Watson IoT MQTT uh, IoT service, which uses MQTT as the connection between clients and, and the cloud. I also work primarily on the Eclipse Powerhole project, which is, Im which is implementations of MQTT client libraries. And I've done that for six or seven years. Uh, that's a bit of short history of what I've been working on. So um, the question you might be asking is, well, I expect some people will be asking is, why do we need a new version of MQTT? So that's what I'm going to go through today and some of the details of the differences between MQTT version 5 and 3.1.1 uh, and a quick run through some of the implementations that we have already and what's planned for the future. So MQTT is uh, historically the answer to a polling problem. But this is a page from the Doomsday Book, which was a book of the records of the taxable uh, assets of the United Kingdom drawn up by William the Conqueror in 1066. So they took, there were 20 or, odd people uh, sent around the, the United Kingdom to get all of, of the details of the uh, assets of, uh, of people around the country. And that actually is a page of the Doomsday Book from the village where I live at the moment. So that took a year, about a year, to collate all of that information. And obviously, uh, in this day and age, we would like to collate that sort of information for things like oil pipelines a lot quicker than a year. Uh, this was the original reason for MQTT being invented. The problem was that there was an oil pipeline in, in the middle of nowhere in the States, uh, either in Alaska or in the deserts of Nevada, that sort of thing. And they wanted to be able to get pressure readings from the extent of the pipeline, which was you know, a few thousand kilometers across that expanse. And at the time, they used a polling, a polling protocol, uh, which we still use today for industrial devices, SCADA. Uh, but it was polling through these satellite links. And very quickly, the central processor that was doing all of this polling became uh, overloaded. And they couldn't handle any more of the communications. So MQTD was invented to be an intermediary between the SCADA devices and the, uh, the concentrators, still using the satellite com uh, communications and uh, avoiding all of that polling problem. All the polling happens at the concentrators. The rest of it was uh, report on demand, so reducing the frequency of messages being sent over those satellite links. And it was very successful in that approach. So as you can see, MQTD comes from a very practical background. It solves a practical problem. It was never meant to be a particularly elegant or academic protocol, just solving problems in a particular way, in a practical way. That meant that the only features that were added to MQTD, which were, were the ones that were absolutely needed, because one of the absolute requirements was to be as lightweight as possible, send as few bytes over the wire, at least overheaders could be managed. Uh, and some of those goals are encapsulated from, this was drawn up in 1988. This was uh, an example of those, one of those concentrators, uh, actually a later version of one of those concentrators, but that's similar to the actual hardware that was used by the firm uh, Arc of Controls. As you can see, in, in the early days, large numbers of clients, uh, ten, they talked talk about 10K clients. These days, we talk about millions or billions, potentially. <coughs> In the first version of the spec that I read, 50 clients was deemed to be a lot. So we've moved on since then. This is uh, a chart from the Eclipse Foundation. This just shows the number of visitors to the Eclipse IoT websites. The top two are MQTD related, just to show some of the popularity of MQTD within the, Eclipse, the IoT world. And this was a result from a recent Eclipse developer survey. MQTT is the most popular protocol on here. Uh, HTTP used to be, so it's a close run thing between HTTP and MQTT for connection between devices and, and cloud. And, and MQTT is, is uh, increasing its advantage over HTTP. Uh, I'm not sure why WebSocket is specified as a different thing. HTTP2, well, 
is also figuring in there. That's a, there's an increase in that, but as you can see, MQTT is on the, uh, uh, the, the winning side of things. So after that history of MQTT, when it was first drawn up in 1998, for a long time it wasn't a standard. It was an, M an MQTT, it was a specification published by IBM, so it was open and free, but it wasn't a standard. And so in the late 2000s, when we were going into customers, they were, we were being asked, well, could you make it a standard? Because we'd like to adopt it, but uh, it really needs to be a standard for us to, to be uh, adopting it in our solutions. So in 2013, it was made into a standard, but the, the first goal at that point was to make it into a standard as quickly as possible to achieve that in as short as possible a time, which meant that we could make very few changes to MQTT as, as it stood. The, the goal was to provide least disruption for existing implementations and get to a standard quickly. So the only changes we could make were to the connect command, everything else had to stay the same. Which meant there were a, a several long outstanding little foibles or issues, that, things that we could have fixed in MQTT, MQTT 3.1.1 which we didn't, and these are some of them. I think the biggest omission is error reporting. For, for various reasons, we had no way of sending a negative acknowledgement to a published request. So uh, MQTD 3.1.1 didn't fix that. But there were no, there's no properties on messages, uh, and we had no way of load balancing. So there were several concerns for cloud implementations that weren't fixed in 3.1.1, so we were looking to address all of those. So we took those areas and then went into them in more detail and drilled down to, fit, to <coughs> identify particular areas that we needed to solve for MQTT version 5. And so we had these large buckets that we went into uh, more detail and those were part of the charter drawn up for our MQTT version 5 technical committee for standardization. As you can see, uh, we've got a number, of a number of companies on that committee, as well as IBM. Microsoft played a big part and helped us out to, to a great deal. There's a couple of other companies, small ones like uh, DC Square, which are very interested in MQTT because they use it uh, to a great extent already. And the point about this chart is we're almost at the end of the standardization process. So we're right down there, and there are a few final bits of red tape to be completed, but there should be no further substantive changes to the specification as it stands. So if you were to implement MQTT version 5 at the moment, there's no reason that any of it should have to change in the time that's left before the final version is published. This is the latest version that we have at the moment. But, uh, it's, uh, you can rely on it, there's, there's, there's no significant uh, changes that are going to be made. So, a quick run through to all the main changes between version 5 and 3.1.1. All the packets remain the same. We have one new one which is called auth, which allows challenge response authentication exchanges. There's no prescribed way which you have to use it, so it's entirely up to the clients and servers how they want to implement uh, and use that, pack, that new packet. For error reporting, we wanted to obviously fix all of that. So the first part of that is now there are every packet, every response packet has a reason code, and we have a defined set of values which you can use in your application so the server can tell the client exactly what's gone wrong with their request and then the client application can make a, an appropriate uh, adjustment to the exchange. There's one, it's just one byte, uh, the values below 127, 127 below are, mean that the request worked, 128, 8 and above means that it failed and then there's a reason for that. So this means that, for example, in the QS2 exchange, in version 3.1.1 and previous, 
versions. The only way that you could get out of a published exchange, which comprises of four exchanges of packets. Uh, if something went wrong in the middle, you had two options. One was to terminate the TCP connection entirely, or to continue the exchange till the end. Uh, those are the only two ways out. Uh, in version 5, you can send the return code on any of the intermediate packets, stop the exchange, tell the, the other end, the receiver, exactly what, what went wrong, and then carry on with the conversation so it's more efficient. Every packet has a set of properties that are available as well. That's been added since version 3.1.1. So these properties are used for lots of different features in, the, in version 5. Uh, we also have user properties, so for whatever you want to send from the client to the server or, or server to the client, you can use those properties for that information. Uh, we also have a reason string, so if the reason code isn't enough for you to tell exactly what went wrong with a particular opera operation, that you can enhance that uh, information with a reason string. One of my big complaints of version 3.1.1 was that there was, it was pretty awkward to do something quite simple in some cases. So in this case, if you wanted it to start a session uh, with, between a client and a server with a completely clean state, you had to connect clean session. Clean session meant the session state was going to be cleaned up at the beginning and at the end. So if you want to start with a clean session but have a, a sort of unit of work which terminates at a disconnect, but you might lose, accidentally lose uh, connectivity in, in the middle of that work, then you needed to do this exchange in version 3.1.1. So you need to clear, you can clean the state by connecting clean session, then disconnecting. Clean session false, or reconnect with clean session false, because that means that when the, the, connect, when the connectivity is lost, uh, when you reconnect, the session state isn't cleaned up again. Uh, so it's quite complicated to get all of that to work. In version 5, you can just connect with a clean start equals true. So clean session flag becomes clean start. The session state is only cleaned up at the start of the connection. And then you have a separate value called, a separate property called the expiry interval, which defaults to zero, or you can reset it to infinity in this case. So that does the job in one, one packet instead. In version 3.1.1, if the server for perfectly good reasons wanted to get rid of the clients, like shutting down, then the only way, the only recourse it had was to close the TCP connection, which meant the client application would be sitting around thinking, oh well, my connectivity has gone away, I wonder why, should I retry right away or should I wait a bit? I have no idea. So in version 5, the server can send a disconnect packet and tell the, the client application exactly what uh, the situation is, and then the client application can make some reasonable attempt at guessing whether or taking the appropriate action. So it can send the disconnect saying, I'm shutting down, don't try for another 30 minutes until I've come back up, or, that, or something similar to that. There's a facility for request response. So uh, MQTT is uh, generally a published subscribe protocol. So we have topics, you subscribe to a topic, and then uh, the sender publishes to that topic. And however many people have subscribed to that topic, they all get uh, the uh, corresponding message. Request response is more like a one-to-one uh, -one exchange. So we have some facilities in version 5 for, to enable that as well. Uh, it's quite simple. It's, there's just a set of properties. There's, there's a, a response pop topic property on the publish. So the receiver can use that to uh, send a response to that, back to that topic. And then the receiver can use an, a separate property called correlation ID to correlate res responses to requests. We have a very simple payload format indicator in, as a property. Uh, it just has two values, uh, 0 for bytes and 1 for UTF-8 strings. We did, in the committee, discuss a whole raft of options, including MIME types, uh, and I think this was the, the lowest, common lowest common denominator that we ended up with. So hopefully we'll pe people will be satisfied with that, but I can see that we might uh, have some minor additions to the 
specification in, in forthcoming years when people decide that they want a few more options. Uh, shared subscriptions is a way of turning publish, subscribe into a bit more of a queue. So this is ex ex intended especially for high workload situations. So you have a, a topic where many people are publishing messages to it and you want to allow more than one handler of the messages received on that topic. In normal publish, sub publish subscribe, if you have more than one receiver, more than one subscriber to a topic, all of those subscribers still get all of those messages. So it doesn't really help you out with uh, workload handling. Shared subscriptions means that only one of the subscribers will get the messages sent to that topic. So it means that you can expand the number of subscribers and handle the workloads better. Uh, interestingly or, or amusingly, we don't specify any algorithm that, that the server has to use to distribute those messages. So in theory, you, the server could still send those messages all to the same subscriber in that, in that subscription group, which uh, would still conform to the specification but wouldn't be a very useful server. So I'd, if, if I encountered a server like that, I'd made a defect on it. I think that uh, you know, MQTT has always been allowing options to allow people to implement servers efficiently. So when that, in that case, uh, if we'd prescribed an algorithm, then it would have meant that uh, it would never have been perfect and people would have wanted to change it in the future. So that was really the only way forward. We have a few <laughs> enhancements to subscriptions, like the no local option that's available in JMS, where you, the sender of a message doesn't want to receive that message back. Uh, we have some control over retained messages. So retained messages are a feature of MQTT where, whereby you can set uh, a l the last known good value for a topic. So it's an option on, a on the publish saying I want this message to be retained. So it me means that if there's a value, say, for the pressure in that oil pipeline, uh, that can be stored as, th as the last known value of that, of that pressure, pressure as a retained message. This provides some problems in some scenarios, especially if you're bridging between MQTT servers. So now we have a way of controlling retained messages. Uh, but the default, as it was before, is when you subscribe, you'll get all the retained messages. Now there are some options for never getting them or only getting them if the, retained, if the subscriptions are new. We have topic aliases. So this is an idea from MQTT SN and some other protocols. Uh, if you have a long topic name, then you can replace it in subsequent publish packets with uh, an, an index number. And that's using the properties again. We also have used properties in the connect packet and the connect, and the connect response packets for the clients and servers to uh, be able to communicate to the other, the other end some of their capabilities. So if you have a very for, small client like implemented on an Arduino and, and the, there's no way you can handle a two meg message, the, the largest message you can handle is 2K, then it can, it can now tell the server uh, the maximum packet size it can handle. Likewise, you can tell, tell the server what's the maximum number of in-flight or simultaneous QS1 and 2 messages it can handle because each of those requires a bit of state. So uh, the server can say, do the same thing and also re advertise some other capabilities. So this means that there's a, there's a lot cleaner exchanges between clients and servers. There's uh, subscription IDs which are useful only when, if you have wildcard subscriptions, and the resulting messages come back from multiple matches to subscriptions. subscriptions. Previously, you couldn't tell which sub subscription matched which message, and sub subscription IDs allow you to fix that. And flow control. Uh, so that advertising mechanism of the receive maximum, the maximum number of simultaneous QS1 and 2 messages, this allows you to uh, pause the flow of messages. If you, you can say, uh, I only want two at a time. So if I've got two in process and I haven't sent the acts back, then uh, the, the sender mustn't send any more in the meantime. So this is a way of uh, making sure that the, re the receiver isn't overloaded. Uh, 
Okay, so a uh, summary of that. Uh, we've almost finished with the MQTT v5 standard. MQTT v version 3.11, version 3.1.1, I still find that hard to say, uh, is not deprecated. Uh, it's still simpler than version 5, although I think the complications for version 5 are not great over version 3. But I env envisage that they will coexist for a long time. Uh, for the next steps in the standardization process, I think that we'll probably look at MQTD SN, which is a way of applying MQTD to non-TCP transports, mesh networks, UDP, things like that. And currently there are a few implementations around, so this is the, the issues for the PAHO Java client, which is going to be completed, the first pass is going to be completed this month, at the end of this month. Uh, I've got some uh, write-ups about, this is about the C client on my blog. Uh, so very soon at the end of June, we're going to have a, uh, the C client and the Java client, so PAHO. Uh, the Eclipse Mosquito Broker has planned to have an, a version 5 implementation at the end of August. And uh, there are also some other implementations which have been in process for quite a while. So HiveMQ, uh, BurnMQ, and a new one that I've recently learned about, which is from an Eastern European company. So in PAHO, at the moment, we already have a, uh, a server. So I started developing the C client in uh, the middle of last year. And so to, to help that, we had no version 5 brokers at the time. So I wrote a version 5 broker in Python, and that's available in the PAHO testing repository. As you can see from this, or you might be able to see from this, um, one of the things it does is uh, each of these is a, a conformance statement from the MQTT specification. So when you uh, interact with the server, it notes all of the conform statements that have been hit. So the idea that I'm going to use this for is to uh, be able to generate MQTT test suites because this can be used as a, as a measure of coverage. So when you've uh, achieved, encountered all of the conform statements from the specification, then that's a pretty good test suite. It covers all the aspects of MQTT. And this is using a test suite from the PAHO C client. I'm just going to run against that. There's just, there's just some other clients, some version 3 clients running at the moment. I'll just get those. So that's some version 5 interactions going on. And you should be able to see from this that we've got this. this it, the broker displays all the packets received and sent out so you can debug what's going on. And so we've got things like user properties and the like, and subscription identifiers, which are only v5 features. So that's all available at the moment. Uh, there's a few implementations that are available already, and even more that will be available for the, towards the end of the year. So uh, although Paho is a a success, successful project. We're always looking for new contributions. So if anybody is interested in working with us, then uh, get involved in the issues on any of the clients. So we have uh, clients for Java and Android, JavaScript, uh, C and C++, Python, and, and Go. We have some a new Ruby client that's just been contributed. Uh, and obviously there's a, a load of other languages out there at the moment, but I think most of them could either use the, uh, the Java client underneath if they run in the JVM or the, or the C client. So if you do want to get in touch with us as well, there's uh, myself and James are the project leaders, and these are the ways that you can get in touch with PAHO as well as the interacting on GitHub through the issues and the, the repos there. Okay, that's all I want to uh, say today. So, are there any questions?
No? Okay. And thank you.